opportunity, different therapeutic exercises, and, and certainly more than that. But these are many of the mainstays. And in any given rehabilitate, excuse me, rehabilitation treatment, we may use one or two or multiple of these in combination in a therapy that's ideally designed to target what that pet needs and what we're working on for that animal. So the piece that I wanted to share with you all today um, is one of my favorites, um, and you'll see some videos of this little guy. This is not him, but he uh, was a 10-year-old Yorkshire Terrier at the time of this case. And he was attacked when he was just out walking with his owner um, by a roaming dog. And his shoulder blade or scapula was broken by that attack, and he had numerous bite wounds. And so when we first saw him here through the Midwestern University Companion Animal Clin Clinic. We evaluated all of his injuries, treated his wounds, and then because he's just a little teeny tiny Yorkie, um, we elected to put his uh, broken uh, shoulder blade in a sling to immobilize it so that that bone could heal. So he didn't actually need any major surgery for his broken bone, he just needed this sling, um, but that can still be a, a pretty big deal thing as you'll see here. So um, I first met this little guy when I saw him when he came in for a recheck um, several weeks after he'd been placed in a sling. And we saw on his x-rays that his bone was really healing quite well. It wasn't fully healed, but it knitted back together much of the way. But because he'd had his leg scrunched up in this sling for several weeks, he'd lost a lot of the range of motion in his limb, which we know happens anytime we immobilize a joint. Um, we can lose sort of the normal flexion and extension that we would expect. And so um, on the left here are the um, normal, well, excuse me, so um, flexion of his wrist and elbow is written here and then extension of his uh, wrist and elbow is at the right side of the screen. And so his ability to flex his wrist and elbow is just fine but he wasn't able to extend them normally. So his limb was kind of kept in this curled position. He wasn't walking on it normally after all of this time being immobilized. And you can see it's pretty dramatic. You know, the elbow should be able to extend out to almost straight and his could only extend out just a little ways. And this is measuring the, the angle of a joint with a device like this. And um, his wrist also, kept in a very flexed position so that he couldn't use that leg normally at all, even though the bone was healing pretty well. So I decided that rehab was a really good way for him to move forward. And we had some specific goals for him in rehab that we wanted to be able to improve his range of motion, restore the use of this limb, and then potentially uh, aid a little bit in healing of his broken bone. So we know that some of our therapies like the laser and potentially the shockwave device may be benef beneficial for promoting bone healing as well. So this is our little friend at his initial visit um, with two of our technicians. And you can see he's quite the stylish fellow. Um, this is because he's being treated with our low level laser. And that does have potentially harmful effects to the eye. And so um, our technicians are protecting their eyes with some special safety glasses and we're protecting his as well. Plus it looks really cute, so that's a bonus. Um, so he was treated initially at that visit with some laser therapy, some warm compresses on those contracted joints, gentle stretching, and then some little balance exercises. So you can see we have these little tiny inflatable devices on the table for him and getting him to kind of balance himself a little bit on those um, to help test his, his sense of where his legs are in space. A big part of rehab as well, it's a, it's a nice thing we can do a lot here, but it also really relies on the pet owner um, to do some treatment at home as well. So we outlined a home care plan for him, um, showed his mom how to do some stretching activities with him, this PRON stands for passive range of motion. So essentially just taking his little leg and basically moving it like he's riding a little invisible bicycle, just cycling all those joints through a range of motion. So they're flexing and extending and he's getting used to that again. A little gentle massage 
and some toe tapping. So at this point, he's not really setting his leg down. So just encouraging him to gently set that foot down intermittently so that he can start to experience weight bearing on that limb again. So a little bit more about laser therapy. Um, the low level lasers that we're talking about, they're all on a continuum. Um, you know, the laser pointers that you see people use when they're um, you know, teaching a class or something, those are kind of the same deal, but just uh, really, really wimpy. And then the high powered version that I sometimes use in the operating room is a much more intense version. And these are, are kind of in the middle. So um, a little bit higher energy, but does produce laser light, which we know can change how cells function. So at this level, the light that we transmit with the laser is absorbed at the cellular level and changes the activity in the cell. And so it releases a bunch of different molecules and changes the activity in a way that can decrease inflammation, decrease pain, um, and in another setting, what I like to use it for a lot is that it can actually improve wound healing. So if we have complicated wounds, sometimes we'll treat them with a little bit of laser therapy to try and help move things along. So for a case like Freddie, it's not a painful experience. It's not something that there's much of any sensation to at all for the pet, but something that can be really beneficial for anti-inflammatory and, and effects to decrease pain as well. So Freddie was a, a visitor with us for several weeks. And so his um, second and third week, he uh, came in and was setting his foot down occasionally, which was a big improvement. You can see here in this picture, um, his leg still has kind of that little curl to his wrist, but he is actually putting it down. He's not keeping it um, held up at, his, at the side of his body, but still has that little flexion of his wrist. And so we've modified his treatment slightly now that he's a little bit more comfortable and he's gaining a little bit more confidence to do some warm compressing, working a little bit more on balancing exercises. So this um, little inflatable that he's standing on, it has this irregular surface to provide a little bit more sensory input for him. We did do some electrical stimulation therapy, which sounds a little bit scary, but um, it's something that is used quite a bit in people. And I think the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Continued with his laser therapy, had him walk on some irregular surfaces. Um, we do a lot of obstacle courses for our pets and uh, we'll share some of those with you here and then continued his home exercise plan. So electrical stimulation is often administered um, in the fashion shown in this picture um, with just some little pads affixed in the area of interest. And it can be used in a couple of different ways. You can actually um, set this electrical current to stimulate muscle contractions in a way that can cause muscle strengthening. Or, and what we do much more commonly is use it at a lower level so that it causes pain relief and can cause some reduction in the um, fluid accumulation or swelling that we may have which we sometimes see um, after surgery. And so it can be used well there, but he had, uh, our, our little case in question, he had not been using that leg very frequently. And so his muscles had really atrophied. And so we thought we would try to use some electrical stimulation for him. We didn't end up sticking with it for very long because he is actually such a teeny tiny little dog that we had a hard time finding pads small enough to fit on his little leg effectively. But um, did have a couple good sessions with electrical stimulation for him. So uh, here's an example of this guy uh, getting a little bit better and starting to motor using that left foot. And so you'll see him walk over this uneven terrain, this little obstacle course here. And you can note that he's getting more confident, but still is a little bit reluctant to set that foot down and certainly is pretty ginger on it, walking in sort of an uncomfortable fashion there. And we have his mom set up at the end of the obstacle course, so he's very motivated to go to her. Um, in other cases, sometimes the best motivator is a good treat. Um, and with kitties, what we'll often use is a little uh, area to hide or their bed at the end of an obstacle course, and they're happy to um, motor along in order to get to those at the finish line. So he continued to make really steady, great improvement 
continued to use that limb better and better. And we found he would uh, place that limb while he was walking about three quarters of the time. And the problem we had is that when he went to place his foot, he would sometimes walk on the, on the top of it. He would kind of knuckle over and not extend his wrist appropriately. The good news is that he was a lot more comfortable than he had been. It had been sort of a, a painful sensation for him to extend those joints, but that was starting to feel um, just fine for him and uh, made continued progress and ultimately ended up adding in some underwater treadmill for him. So you don't need a whole heck of a lot of water for a guy that little to be able to swim and have a little bit of extra buoyancy, um, but allowed him to start exercising and building up his muscle mass in that leg. So this is our underwater treadmill. Um, dogs and cats are very photogenic in the underwater treadmill, so we enjoy that quite a bit. Um, but it does actually have benefits other than just being extremely cute. <laughs> so um, the advantages that we have with the underwater treadmill is that it provides a lot of buoyancy for um, animals to walk in the water. So if there's a painful joint, we can uh, take some of the load off of that pet so that as they're walking, they're not having as much force transmitted through that joint. So it's a great way to allow an animal that's in pain or has painful joints to get a little bit more exercise and activity in a way that's gonna be comfortable for them. We also use very nice warm water and so that thermal or temperature effect can be helpful and feel very good. The hydrostatic pressure or pressure of the water can also help reduce edema and improve their comfort. And then it's pretty good exercise. So it's basically the same principle as, you know, aqua aerobics or that sort of thing. And that walking in water provides a lot of resistance. So it's a good way to develop uh, strength in an animal that's trying to build back some muscle. And so we do use it for just a good low impact exercise, low impact on the joints, for reduction of edema or swelling in a limb or in an animal that has an altered range of motion. So like Freddie, if their flexion and extension of the limb isn't normal, this can be a good way to get them to move that leg a little bit more normally. So this is a few weeks on, and here's one of these uh, obstacle courses that I promised you. Um, I will say our veterinary students are increasingly inventive in the obstacle courses that they design, but this gives you a good idea of how much he's progressed in a pretty short period of time, from not using it all, using that leg at all, to using it fairly consistently. He's got a team of cheerleaders the whole way along. You can see he's setting that leg down. He's still a little bit ginger on it, but doing very well. So towards the end of his treatment here at home, he has a lot more confidence. He's going on walks outside and really a big change in how he's able to get around. So we maintained a lot of our, our same exercises and treatments, warm compressing, stretching, balance exercises. Our obstacle courses or floor exercises um, and using some treadmills going up and down ramps again trying to build up his strength and build up his confidence for walking in in different settings and not just going the three legs dogs are a little bit tough because um, you know for humans we really rely on both of our legs but um, dogs we joke sometimes they have three legs in a spare because if one's bugging them they'll just pick it up and, and motor around on three legs so we really want this patient to get back to using all four of his legs with good confidence and comfort. So this is, this is the elite level obstacle course, and this is where he's really just showing off. So um, these are some fancy little ramps that we've designed. Needs a little bit of encouragement, but then he picks up speed right away. He's delighted to be uh, cruising along there, making great progress, and then right to mom at the end. So overall for this patient, he had a couple of months of rehab and did have an excellent outcome ultimately. Um, and I would really attribute that to his mom, who is incredibly dedicated to him um, and did a great job with his home exercise program. And then having a really specific diagnosis and goals. So we knew what we wanted to achieve with rehab for him. We wanted to improve his range of motion of his wrist and elbow 
and get him to a point where he was consistently and comfortably using that leg again after his um, dog attack and broken shoulder blade. And one last one because I couldn't resist. <laughs> so he has a whole uh, cheering section, which is not at all unusual um, and had a really great outcome. So just a nice case to share there. Um, I often get the question, what about kitties? So it's easy enough to get uh, dogs to go in water and dogs to do an obstacle course, um, but what can we do for, for our feline patients? We do know that pain and lameness is underappreciated in cats in general, so arthritis is much more common in cats than we tend to diagnose it. And, and we miss it so much because um, cats are a lot less active, obviously, than dogs. Very few people are taking their cats uh, out for a walk in the neighborhood. And cats are um, much more private about discomfort, so they tend not to obviously show off oh, pardon. Uh, tend not to obviously show off that they're in pain. So what we may notice with them is just that they are not um, as active as they used to be. They may not choose to jump up and down on things as much. We may see changes in their grooming habits. So it can be very subtle. But the real question is, is rehab a reasonable option? And what I would say is maybe not for every cat. There are some cats that would be um, pretty scared by it. But I think remarkably, a lot of cats do very well with rehabilitation. If we take it slow and make it a welcoming environment. Um, and I'm gonna share my, one of my very favorite kitty patients ever. And this cat had um, two broken hips, basically. He um, was born um, with a condition that essentially made him at risk for two broken hips. And so this is after his surgery. And you can see he's navigated that obstacle course pretty darn efficiently there. So um, doing a great job of getting around. And you can see that he's quite um, comfortable in his environment. He's a great big handsome kitty, big beautiful Maine Coon. But he wants to go through that obstacle course and get to his cozy bed at the end. And then of course the, the shocker here and one of my favorite things to always share is that this guy was also just fine in the underwater treadmill. So big handsome kitty in the underwater treadmill. We've got a little resistance band under his belly to make him work a little bit harder. And he's trying to check out his dad there, um, doing really well with that kind of therapy. So in many cases, you might not think cats would tolerate rehab, but they actually um, are a lot braver than we give them credit for. So just some kind of concluding thoughts here. Um, if you do have a pet that you think rehab might be a good fit for, it's definitely something to discuss with your veterinarian, whether or not they think that's appropriate. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's something really where we really need to work towards a diagnosis, whether that's um, with just a physical exam or in many cases, x-rays, if we're worried about um, arthritis as an underlying cause. And we wanna come up with a collaborative plan um, you know, based on veterinary recommendations and what you feel is the best fit for your pet, um, bringing all of that together, determining if rehab is a good fit. And I am pleased to say that the Midwestern University Companion Animal Clinic, through our surgery service, we offer rehabilitation services for dogs and cats. So if you think it's uh, something that you'd be interested in learning more or discussing with us here, and certainly make an appointment through the surgery service for um, further consultation about rehabilitation therapy. So these are just a few of my uh, veterinary students uh, showing off with this patient. This is uh, his graduation from rehab celebration. So um, they do get pretty spoiled in rehab as well, which is uh, fun for everybody, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Okay, that was a great, great presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaver. Um, I invite any of the uh, participants to uh, use the chat feature to ask any questions that they might have. Um, 
um, stand by and wait for them. But in the meantime, I had, I had a couple questions. Um, so do you, do, you, do you recall the cat's name that had the broken hips? I, I know Freddie now. I feel like I've known him my whole life. But yes. what's that cat's name? Wyatt. Wyatt. <laughs> he was a big, handsome Maine Coon. And I may have missed this, but can you talk or explain what the shockwave therapy is? Certainly. So um, the shockwave therapy essentially is a way that we can transmit energy deep into the tissue. And so basically that transmission of energy can stimulate changes at the cellular level that promote healing. So in particular, it can be good for bony healing if we have a broken bone. Um, we didn't end up using shockwave um, with our, our little star performer here, but um, it would have been a reasonable option if he'd had a hard time getting his shoulder blade to heal um, and that it can stimulate those little bone cells to proliferate and improve the healing process. So it's a, basically a um, using energy to stimulate cellular activity. Okay, thanks for that explanation. I appreciate it. So we did have a question come in. Uh, one of our viewers wants to know what is the most memorable experience you've had with a pet in rehab? <laughs> um, well, I will say that big handsome kitty is one of my very favorites. Um, just in that he was such a, a a memorable guy. Putting a cat in an underwater treadmill is something that we don't do every day. I will admit. Um, but I think that the nice thing about rehab is that it really is a chance for us to develop a real partnership um, with a client and with a pet. And the thing that I think I like the, the very best is that I would say 99% of our rehab patients are delighted to come to the hospital. And I don't get to see that all the time when I have you know, a patient who's coming in for surgery. They're not used to it. It's a new environment. But because we do tend to see these guys fairly routinely for some number of weeks, this becomes a very happy place for them. And so as a veterinarian, it's a real treat for me to see them to love when they love to come to the hospital. And uh, that honestly never gets old for me. Okay, great. Um, another question from that uh, same viewer is this, I showed up a little late, but is there a bridge from human physical therapy to veterinarian physical therapy? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. And I'll, uh, you know, touched on that very briefly earlier, but definitely this is sort of the analogous um, counterpart with animals compared to human physical therapy. Um, the caveat there is that I am by no means a physical therapist, nor do I have that level of expertise compared to a human physical therapist where they do their own degree program and have um, a tremendous amount of knowledge. But this is sort of the synthesis of some of those um, modalities and approaches that we are the beneficiaries of in human physical therapy, plus the high level of knowledge I have as a veterinarian about anatomy, physiology, and the injuries that can happen in dogs and cats, and sort of the blending of the two. So interestingly, the, the courses that are out there that are taught in canine rehabilitation typically are open to uh, human physical therapists and physical therapy assistants, as well as veterinarians and veterinary technicians, because it is a great way in which those professions can really come together to provide a service to people and their pets. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, another question came in. I'm not exactly sure what the, the viewer is getting at, but, but maybe you can kind of uh, tease it out. The question reads, um, how do we put pets on water or in water to relieve pain? So I don't know if it's, you know, getting at um, maybe the, uh, the, the water therapy you're describing, but maybe you can talk about how, how that process works and um, how that may or may not relieve uh, pain in a pet. Absolutely. Um, I think, and, and to that viewer, please let me know if this doesn't address your question adequately, but um, basically the use of, of water is good for a lot of different reasons, um, in much the same way that um, as people, if we have joint issues, swimming is a great low impact activity. So the buoyancy and the um, hydrostatic pressure, the pressure of the water um, can allow us to have resistance and uh, Build, it's basically strength training without being high impact and causing a lot of wear and tear on our joints. The same is true for pets. 
um, in terms of the mechanics of introducing an animal to water therapy, um, what we do, um, our underwater treadmill is very nice because we have total control over it. So we can set the water height to any level that we want. And so we typically start at a very low level to allow that animal to get very comfortable with it. Um, we also do use little life jackets as well. Um, if there's any level that's you know deeper than kind of elbow high, essentially, um, so that there's and someone is always with them. Usually, a couple of people are with them, so that it's quite a safe experience. Um, and the life jackets have little handles on them, so we can kind of gradually ease them into the idea. Um, of course, many dogs love water and love swimming, and it's no big deal at all. Um, it can be a little bit trickier with some of our pets that. Um, are a little more water averse. And I do talk to a lot of clients who say, well, um, you know, I have a pool and I would love to you know, do some of this at home for my pet. They have some arthritis. Um, maybe I can get them swimming and that would be a beneficial thing. And I think that's, um, you know, always something to bring up with your veterinarian before you try something new with your pet to see if they think it's reasonable. But some sort of general things I think about are um, if you're doing it to minimize high impact activity, I've known a lot of Labrador retrievers that love to swim, but are also hooligans when they get in and out of the water. So it doesn't count as low impact if they're diving in and jumping out and, and being real crazy. And I, I do really recommend the doggy life jackets that are out there, especially if you have an animal who's not used to the water or the, their mobility is a little bit compromised, you know, get in the water with them. And uh, some of those, um, doggy life jackets with handles can be really beneficial, help make your pet feel a little bit more safe, help make your pet actually a little bit more safe. And so that can be a, a nice approach if you're introducing that at home. Great, thanks for those tips and that information. Got another question here for you. Um, this viewer's pup is just one week post-op from, and I don't know what these things are, from a TPLO and MPL. Sure. Is this going to make him more of a candidate for arthritis later in his years? He's only five years old now. Maybe you can explain what a T or just or just tell us what a TPLO and an MPL are. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a TPLO is a surgery that we perform when dogs tear their cranial cruciate ligament. It's basically like the ACL in people. There are a few differences, but that's generally the idea. And an MPL is uh, stands for medial patellar luxation. Uh, which is when the kneecap slides out of its groove. Um, and those um, can certainly go hand in hand, having both the cruciate injury and the patellar luxation. Um, not unusual for those both to happen. Um, we know that whenever, unfortunately, the cruciate ligament is torn, um, they're never going to be normal again. So it's fantastic you were able to get surgery for your pet. Um, and that's hopefully going to get them back to as close to full function as soon as possible, which is wonderful. Um, but we can't really put the genie back in the bottle. So there will be some degree of arthritis. And that's why it's important to think about things like uh, making sure your dog remains at a healthy weight. You know, we want to take the load off of those joints if we can. Thinking about supplements like um, omega-3 fatty acids, glucosamine, some of that stuff we don't have great evidence for. but um, I, I usually tell my clients it probably won't hurt and it might help, so reasonable to try. And then I think uh, rehab can be a great option, and certainly rehab is great for those cases in the post-operative period. Um, we hold off on a lot of things until the skin incision is healed, which is about a two-week um, time period afterwards. But even during that time, we can use a laser on the surgical incision, which can help it heal up and decrease the local inflammation, do some stretching, some hot and cold therapy, and then gradually sort of ramp up, much as you saw we did with the case I presented. Great. One viewer um, had this question. As someone who is interested in rehabilitation, is there anything you recommend to start getting involved with it? Um, I think it depends a little bit on your background. Um, if, the, if the main background is uh, dog owner and lover, which I certainly relate to, um, there are some, some good books out there. I think sort of a easy introduction to it is through canine massage, and there are some, some good books about that um, that introduce anatomy. And anatomy is such an important part of what we do. So 
knowing what muscle groups you're feeling, knowing what muscle groups are tight, um, learning some of the basics there can be a good way to kind of get your feet wet if it's an area you're interested in. Um, and then again, always, um, you know, if you are starting to, um, you know, think about delivering treatments to your pets, if there's something where your animal is sore, definitely touch base with your veterinarian just to make sure they think it's a reasonable way to move forward and, and not something where we might accidentally end up doing more harm than good. Okay, great. Another viewer wants to know how you get the e -stim I, I guess they're electronic stimulation pads. Yeah. How you get the e stim pads to stick to the pet skin? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. They come sticky, fortunately, um, but it actually raises a, a good issue that um, is related to a lot of these therapies and which which is that many of them are more effective on non-haired skin and so that's a little bit different for us um, on the veterinary side than it is in the human realm and that fortunately at least i would imagine from a physical therapy perspective uh, most humans are not that hairy <laughs> so uh, we do end up having to to create some bad haircuts depending on the therapy that we're pursuing so the the shockwave therapy um, is, is one in particular where we do like to clip the hair over our treatment site and we try to minimize that as much as possible. If we're just treating the knee, we can just clip a little area of hair um, and several other things where um, we do like to have a small area of hair clip. So that's something we do, we do discuss that with our owners before we just uh, go bonkers with the clippers, but uh, <laughs> something that's important to have in the back of your mind. Okay, thanks. Um, another viewer wants to know, what is hydrostatic pressure? Hydrostatic pressure um, basically uh, just refers to the pressure exerted by water. So that if you um, are in a swimming pool, essentially there's some degree of pressure on your body from the water that's all around you. I hope that is a reasonable explanation. But so if we have a dog that has you know, swelling in its leg, um, just having that very gentle pressure from the water can help reduce that swelling and, and provide some measure of comfort from that gentle pressure from the water that's all around that area. Does that help? It helps me. We'll see if the viewer wants some more clarification, but I okay. thought that was a great explanation. And these are all great questions. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for chiming Please in. This is great. Comment. It's really a, kind of broadening my understanding of a lot of these points that Dr. Shaver was making. So another viewer wants to know, how much does the pet's willingness or compliance play into their rehab? And if there is an unwilling pet, does this limit their rehabilitation potential or are there workarounds? A fantastic question and something that does certainly come up for us. I think um, we really try to tailor therapy to the individual patient. Um, I think our job has gotten a lot harder in the COVID era because we can't have our clients in the building right now and hopefully things will be shifting back. But certainly as you can see from the videos, um, mom was very involved at the end of all of those obstacle courses and that was a big motivating factor for this dog. And so um, that can be tricky if we really have a pet that we feel like, boy, they would do a lot better if their owner were right here in the room with them. That said, I've also had the opposite be true, that there's a pet that's just so fixated on their owner that they can't do anything else. And so sometimes animals actually do much better. We say, all right, mom or dad, why don't you go wait over here in this viewing room and we'll just get down to work and then the dog can kind of let it go and interact with the person who's administering the treatment. Um, I think if we have um, a dog that's a little bit aggressive, and I would say most of the time, the dogs that we see that are aggressive, it's usually because they're afraid. We can often work with those animals. We just go really slow. And, and as I said, one of the things that I enjoy is that animals do come to realize that this is a safe place where good stuff happens to them, where they get somewhat uh, you know, constant positive feedback and nice stuff happens and they get treats and they get love. And um, so those animals I have found tend to come around that's not to say that all of them do, and I do think they're animals if they're just so afraid or if they are truly um, kind of aggressive for one reason or another. Maybe it's just an environment that they just you know, can't tolerate being in this strange setting. There are some animals for which rehab is, is not a good option. And 
you know, we're usually pretty upfront about that, whether we think it's worth trying or whether it's just going to be, um, you know, stressful to that pet and potentially dangerous for the people who are involved. So certainly not um, 100 percent applicable, but we try to kind of realistically assess it and, and see what workarounds we have. Okay, great. Uh, speaking of how some dogs are uh, just afraid, I, I was, I don't, I don't know if this is something you can speak to, but I was thinking about Freddie, because Freddie was uh, attacked by another dog. Is there any kind of, I don't know, what would it be like, uh, like almost like a psychological rehab? Because I imagine that Freddie won't be very enthusiastic about going for walks if he was indeed attacked, uh, uh, you know, during a walk. Is that ever addressed in, uh, uh, rehab or is that ever brought up in these kind of pet rehab circles? Um, it's a good question. I'm sure that it is. I, I suppose my relatively superficial answer to that is that um, dogs and cats are way tougher than we are. <laughs> so <laughs> stuff that I would never get over would take me forever to bounce back from. These guys just power through and have such great little spirits and uh, don't look back. So it's it's remarkable. Um, how, how tough they are and how resilient they are. I think that in some cases we may have animals that do develop phobias from specific incidents. Um, I, I don't know um, how this little guy really, you know, interacted with other dogs or if he was afraid of big dogs or um, kind of how that evolved for him. But I think um, it's certainly a, a reasonable concern or thought to have. And um, in many cases, I think rehab can be beneficial for a lot of dogs and just that it is in many ways a positive socialization ex exper experience, excuse me, that they're, um, you know, getting out of their home environment, coming to a place that's new and different with new and different people and learning that that is positive and that can be very helpful for a lot of pets. Sure, sure. Okay, we have one final question and not exactly where we're going with this, but Actually, another one just popped up, so we have two. But, but after a, an animal is injured um, and, and sustains an injury, how, I, I guess they're asking how, the, the question reads, how does Midwestern University use cats and dogs for physical therapy after the injury? But maybe they're getting at, you know, how, are there, how is Midwestern uh, contacted? Do you have regular veterinary services just like you would, um, uh, you know, maybe have a private veterinarian. Um, do you just provide rehab service, services after uh, a dog or a cat receives uh, maybe a surgical procedure from an outside vet? Maybe those are the kinds of things that this viewer is, uh, this viewer is getting at with that question. Sure. Uh, thanks for that. I think um, we do have a, a full service hospital here. Basically, um, our companion animal clinic does have a number of primary care doctors who provide sort of um, what most people would think of as uh, routine veterinary care. So wellness appointments, vaccines, things like that. And then we also have specialists who provide um, different more advanced kinds of care. So for me, I'm a surgeon, so I do um, you know, anything from uh, cancer surgery to um, re repairing broken bones, things like that. And, and the rehab service sort of falls under the purview of the surgery team. Um, we have internal medicine specialists, neurologists, um, so quite a lot of different things that are offered here. Um, if we have patients who are seeing our primary care service, we can certainly work with them to see um, if they are good candidates for rehab. Um, and then we're always happy to um, take referrals from outside as well. We typically do have those come in through our surgery service. Even if you know you are really just, you're not, you're not coming for surgery, we get it. You're interested in rehab um, just because we are the veterinarians who oversee that. So um, set you up for an appointment with the surgery service just to make sure we're on the same page, um, establishing kind of what our goals are like we talked about with the presentation and making sure we have a firm diagnosis of what it is that we're hoping to treat and accomplish with rehab. Great. Got a couple more for you. Do you find that most of your patients are motivated to do rehab or is it usually uh, challenging to motivate them? <laughs> I would say uh, the easiest patients for us are the labs because all you have to do to motivate them is get a treat. And that is quite simple. So that's very nice. That makes our jobs a lot easier. Um, I think a lot of uh, pets are also very motivated by um, you know, praise some of the 
you know, more working, working or herding dogs, you know, they're, they're problem solvers. They want to get it right. So they like the idea of an obstacle course that they have to figure out. You know, they're, they're thinking about it a little bit more. So the motivation may be different, um, but we try to figure out what that is. So whether it's praise, whether it's being with the owner, whether it's a treat, whether it's solving the problem, um, figuring that out can help us deliver more effective um, treatment to them. I think in many cases, they're just sort of confused by it in the beginning. And there's a lot that we can do that doesn't really require too much engagement from them. So we do tend to start with the more low key interventions. So laser, stretching, um, icing, stuff that's um, kind of comforting, not scary, doesn't involve them going over ramps or getting in right. an underwater treadmill or doing a bunch of bunker stuff. So we, we tend to crescendo with what we do and, and go at the dog's pace. Okay, great. Uh, this next question is interesting. It has to do with cost. Um, how common is it to see patients coming in with pet insurance? And is it more common to see uh, payment out of pocket? I would say we still um, don't see that many folks with pet insurance. Um, I'd say the majority is probably out of pocket. Um, I do think, boy, pet insurance can come in handy um, and, and be really beneficial um, in many of these cases and, and gives us greater latitude to do what we think is the very best. I think as veterinarians, it's something probably that most people don't really think about for us, but we are as a profession, constantly trying to find the most cost effective way to do something because we want to help the pet as best we can, but we also know that at a certain point, most of our clients didn't win the lottery last weekend. So we're constantly trying to, you know, kind of strike a balance between those two things. And that can be really, really difficult. Um, so having insurance makes us a little bit more like our counterparts in human medicine, where they can say, you know, this is the best thing for this patient and that's what we're going to do which we less commonly have that luxury so um, in this instance you know it for rehab and multiple visits it is really nice to have um, pet insurance as, as something that's on the table because it lets us really let our patient be in charge and and pick the best possible treatment plan for them just based on them and not anything else right right Okay, got another question for you. How common is it to see patients? No, wait, did we just read that? Oh, I'm sorry. This is this is kind of an add-on to that prior question. Is it difficult to justify treatments to insurances as it can be with humans? Um, I guess I haven't had too much pushback. I think the main thing with veterinary insurance, and I'm certainly no expert, so please take this with a grain of salt. Um, is that a lot of them uh, are really big on pre-existing conditions. And so I've certainly seen um, clients where they first start looking into insurance once there's already a problem, and then many of the treatments for that can be excluded as a pre-existing condition. So that can be problematic, but I think people who've sort of you know, gotten coverage on their healthy pet and maintained it, I've not seen very many um, I've not seen much difficulty in getting reimbursement for those claims, but I'm certainly, I'm sure it varies from provider to provider. Sure, I imagine it does. Okay, great questions. I'll give it a, a minute to see if anybody else wants to, to chime in, but um, just wonderful questions, a great discussion, I appreciate that. Um, so kind of going once, going twice. So yeah, th thank you so much, Dr. Shaver, for this interesting uh, and uh, presentation, just full of knowledge. Um, I never knew these kinds of services were provided for pets. And so for me, per per speaking personally, this is a great eye opener for me. Um, so thank you so much. The, My pleasure. Next month's presentation is going to be April 20th. So um, Keep your eyes open for that. We hope you can uh, join us again um, for that presentation. And so I guess that just about wraps it up. I don't see any other questions coming. So thank you everybody for uh, participating today. We appreciate you registering and joining us for this presentation. And hopefully we will see you next month. Thank you one more time to Dr. Shaver and I am going to end this meeting. So goodbye everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.